Just so you'll know, I'm gonna blow something up. Okay. I did not expect that, okay, all right. The video game industry and the military have been intertwined from the start. Places like MIT that were being funded to do this research introduced this revolutionary idea that computers could be used for fun. So you've got Marine Doom on official government computers. How are you holding up? Are you okay? I'm a little shook. War has always made for great gaming. From the earliest text-based battle simulators to the latest Call of Duty. We love games that give us authentic weapons and drop us into hyper-realistic battlefield experiences. But while our favorite video games let us play soldier with the most cutting-edge gear, the truth is, gaming as we know it wouldn't even exist without all the military technology that it was built on. In the next two episodes of Reset, we're taking a look at the untold story behind the U.S. military's relationship with the video game industry and finding out how the Pentagon is using video games to recruit, train and treat servicemen and women of today and tomorrow. The relationship between the military and the video game industry is intertwined right from the start. Electronics for combat just means new concepts. New tool, new weapon. The video game industry actually emerged out of uh, military context and military funding. Corey Mead studies the relationship between the military and the video game industry. The video game industry is built on technologies that were funded for military research. Things like advanced computing graphics or the internet or 3D environments. And it was the computer engineering students at places like MIT that were being funded to do this research that developed the first video games just for their own entertainment. They had kind of that hacker spirit. Space War is considered by most to be the first video game. It was developed in 1962 by a group of uh, engineering students at MIT. They were doing research into space warfare as a Cold War response by the United States against Russia's launching of the Sputnik satellite. By today's standards, or even 1980s standards, Space Wars graphics are not much to look at. But it was one of the first times that programmers used computers for something other than crunching numbers or modeling warfare scenarios. Space War introduced this revolutionary idea that computers could be used for fun. It's out of that that the video games industry emerged. By the 1970s, the military's computer technology had crossed over into the private sector. It had gotten small enough and affordable enough to fit into one of these, a video game arcade cabinet. And the game that marked a new step forward in the relationship between the military and the video game industry was Atari's 1980 hit, Battlezone. Specific forward thinkers in the military saw Battlezone, which was a new level of complexity in terms of the environment and the kind of interactive play, and they wanted to adapt that for training purposes. Tanks are expensive. Artillery rounds for those tanks are also expensive. And training soldiers to operate those tanks, this is all really expensive. So why not modify Atari's wildly successful tank game complete with the Periscope Viewfinder, to be the Army's own tank simulator for their newest weapon, the M2 Bradley Fighting Vehicle. Not a lot of details are known about the collaboration between Atari and the Army, and it isn't clear if Bradley Trainer, aka Military Battlezone, was ever used to actually train soldiers, but they did make at least two custom cases with modified Bradley artillery controls. And if you know where to look, there are copies of the game floating around online. While the game itself didn't wind up as being standard training protocol, computer simulators became an ever larger component of training American troops throughout the 80s. While kids in the US were fighting with their siblings over turns on the NES, the military was developing training networks that would eventually lead to one of gaming's biggest developments, multiplayer mode. Mark 
Simnet was the military's first large-scale interconnected training network, which introduced this revolutionary idea that soldiers didn't have to be in the same place. You could have people all over the country, all over the world, training on the same simulation. All ready to roll? By 1989, soldiers were training on Simnet, just in time to prepare for the tank battles that defined the first foray against Saddam Hussein during the Gulf War. Military leaders credit network simulation training with keeping U.S. casualty numbers low, and precise simulations of those battles were then used to drive training back home. In the 90s, military budgets across the board were reduced because of the fall of communism. Mr. Gorbachev, Tear down this wall. At just that moment, as it happened, the video games industry had reached a level where they had these incredibly advanced gaming systems that could be easily and cheaply adapted for the military. Doom comes out in 1993 and shocks everybody. I think that I can't think of a better way to put it than that. We'd played first person shooters before, we'd played Wolfenstein. But Doom was fast and aggressive. And there were scary demons and unique monsters. And it had this soundscape that other games didn't have. And it had multiplayer in a way that other first person shooters had not had before. If you could set up for computers, you could shoot your friends. And we had not played a first-person shooter that allowed us to do that. And we have maxed out the hub. Woo! Doom codified so much of what we think of as a first-person shooter. And graphically, it just kind of blew everything out of the water. Doom was one of the first games where you really felt like you were exploring a 3D environment that really showed us like what video games could do. The outer space setting and the undead enemy were a pretty far cry from what the US was actually doing at the time in places like Bosnia and Somalia. You look over at the terminal tower. But Doom could be modified, which made that space marine a perfect recruit for the actual United States Marines. In the mid-90s, the Marine Corps were dealing with cuts in their funding, which would make it pretty tough to afford developing a traditional warfighting simulation. So in 1995, they decided to get creative and issued an official mandate to find commercial, off-the-shelf video games that could be used to train Marines. Pretty soon, a small group at Quantico created a Doom mod, which became known as Marine Doom. The Marines don't say, like, we can reuse this to replace live fire training, but they do say that Marine Doom is great for team building and we will allow it to be played on Marine Corps computers. So the Marines were very quick to see what Doom brought to the table as far as new levels of interactivity and fidelity in gameplay and to adapt that for their own military training. Bum. Eventually, the Commandant of the Marine Corps issued an order saying that PC-based war games provide great potential for Marines to develop decision-making skills, and authorized Marines to use government computers for approved PC-based war games, including Marine Doom, and one can assume some games where you could actually aim up. There they go over there! Get them! <laughs> when the military funding started to dry up in the late 90s, partly because of reduced defense budgets. A lot of the technology companies and simulation makers turned to the video game industry to sell their products. That PlayStation 2 you spent hours playing Vice City on? Well, one of the main developers for SimNet built its network engine. Idiot! And as the gaming industry evolved and eventually surpassed the military in terms of developing cutting edge graphics and engines, the relationship evolved too. The military and the entertainment industry reached a new um, kind of bond when they started um, building actual research centers that were funded both by the military and by various entertainment entities to um, create new technologies or new applications of technologies that could potentially benefit the military but would also be used for entertainment purposes, whether in video games or movies or other high-tech forms. 
Or in other words, there's now kind of a cost-sharing arrangement between the military and the private sector, which means that the same tech that goes into a set of these can both help you play fun virtual reality games at home and help soldiers train for war. I wanted to get some more insight on what the connection looks like between the military and the video game industry today. So I've come to the University of Southern California's Institute for Creative Technologies, where they're taking the same tech that we use for video games at home and developing that into military applications. We are working on military training simulations as part of the Synthetic Training Environment Project, the, the STI. And it allows us to use gaming technologies to rapidly prototype what a virtual training system could look like. Arno Arnhold oversees all the technology and art that goes into creating the virtual humans and landscapes the ICT develops. Somebody in the road, stand by. Over. And a lot of it is running on the same engine as games like Fall Guys. So we can take a game engine like Unity and we can use that as a basis to add military specific training features on top of it. We can take a real town create a virtual version of that, and then drop in different soldiers to start prototyping. These synthetic training environment, or STI prototypes, are just one part of the nearly $3 billion investment the military made into virtual simulations in 2020 alone. So as a soldier, you're being transported to a real city, and in that real city, you can encounter enemies that are being driven by AI behaviors. And you, with your squad mates, can train different tactical scenarios. Yeah, this, this is starting to sound like a video game. It's starting to sound like modern warfare. <laughs> it, it, in many ways, it is like a video game, but it's all based on specific training objectives and learning objectives. So the difference there is that it needs to be realistic. It's definitely about doctrine and, and what are the training elements that you want to reinforce in a training scenario. U.S. troops already use a plethora of virtual and game-based training tools, and the STI is set to bring them all into a unified platform by 2023. But the ICT isn't only developing tech to train soldiers, but also to treat them. This looks like Kabul. Oh. Skip Rizzo is a pioneer of developing VR systems for psychological and cognitive treatments. For the past 15 years, he's been working on a VR-based treatment for soldiers with post-traumatic stress disorder called Brave Mind. Goal of this is to help a person with PTSD to go back and in a safe place confront and reprocess these difficult emotional memories. PTSD is different than having just bad memories about hard things. I think about in your own life something bad that happened. You felt horrible when it happened. but. With PTSD, you have that same feeling that you felt right after, month, two months, six months, a year. On an average day in the U.S., about 20 veterans commit suicide. And since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, those numbers have only gone up. We'll start off easy. Okay. Yeah, start, start me off easy, huh? Now, the things I would do in a therapy session would say, okay, what time of day was the event that you're going to talk about today? Was it in the morning? Whoa. Were there clouds in the sky? No. Oh, so you can actually recreate what is in their memory. Well, we mimic it. We're never going to do an exact replica. OK. Just so you'll know, I'm going to blow something up. OK. Yo. I did not expect that. OK, all right. So that's what this platform is here for, yeah. is it's yeah. actually rumbling. That kind of feels real. Yeah. Wow. We don't have our new smell prototype, but the smell prototype fits under the headset. And like when something blows up, you get a, a little puff of like gunpowder, cordite, maybe diesel fuel. Whoa, what, what is this? A dead Whoa, dead. is this what I think it is? Yeah. Damn. That's about as far as we go. We don't believe we need to go full bore blood and guts. Awaiting all clear to roll out, over. It's hard medicine for a hard problem, but scientific basis is to activate the fear and the anxiety and the stress, but in a safe place. And eventually these stimuli no longer trigger this thing we call PTSD. You're always gonna have a bad memory. 
We're not gotta, erasing memories. But you got to go back through it yeah. first. How are you holding up? Are you okay? I'm a little shook. Brave Mind is now being used at some VA hospitals and military bases. Studies have shown that it works as well, or better than, more traditional treatments and may appeal more to younger vets than talk therapy. Who's hurt? How bad? Bell. And Skip is also expanding it to treat sexual trauma experienced by military personnel and potentially COVID survivors and first responders. Let's start with learning how your body reacts to stress. When you encounter a threat to your survival, it's normal for your brain and body to experience stress. We had this idea for what's called stress resilience in virtual environments, STRIVE. And STRIVE was conceptualized as, what if we did a better job on the front end preparing service members for combat emotionally? Hey, this ain't a Disney tour. Everyone, keep your eyes and ears open. Think about a 19-year-old that goes into the military and now they're running a squad and you know getting shot at and seeing horrific wartime things. How do you prepare a 19-year-old or anybody for any of that? He's dead. <gasps> well, <gasps> this son of a bitch is gonna even the score. So what Strive does is take all the content we built for the treatment tool and look at it as like the back lot at Universal Studios where we can put people in stories, immersive narratives with a squad. It's kind of like the story mode on a Call of Duty or something like that. Exactly. But the difference is at the end, the crap hits the fan. We're down. We're down. Oh my God. You copy. Over. We model the six episodes we built on stories we've heard from patients about the things that haunt them. Horrible, horrible things. But these are the things people get confronted with. Mm -hmm. So we build those events out where it ends on a bad note. But in the midst of the chaos, all of a sudden, you get the silence, people freeze in motion, and out walks a virtual mentor. Let's have a talk. Truth is, you will face many situations worse than the ones you just experienced and he'll go through a whole thing of what's going on in the brain during these experiences. Going the into the science during the middle yeah. of the scenario. Yeah, and that this is, you're not a coward if you feel horrible. Here's what's going on in your body, and here is a methodology that might help you to cope with it. I'll teach you ways to use your prefrontal cortex to get through these events and control emotions that can eat you up. You're taking technology, which is going to prepare people for things nobody should ever have to see. That should shake somebody. Absolutely. I don't, this sounds wild. I don't know if we should want somebody to come back from that situation and feel okay. And feel just like every business as usual. You have a great argument here. Are we building things that justify killing or make it easier to kill or to do bad things? You know, these are hard questions. We don't want to turn people into emotionless automaton killers. But the reality is they will be in these situations. And how do we help them to be able to cope where they're not haunted for the rest of their life or they're not limited in what they can do with the rest of their life? Luis Manuel Soto, age 23. May you rest in peace. I think uh, any effort we can make to reduce human suffering is the right thing to do. And if we can use technology to do it better, then I'm all in. It's just hard, Doc. Real hard. It's okay not to feel okay. What's up, y'all? We're back with the Reset Roundtable. We have a lot to get into. So for this time, I've got our Marine Corps veteran, Stephen Kiernan, Motherboard contributing editor, Matthew Galt, and the host of Waypoint Radio, Austin Walker. Thanks for coming on, y'all. Thanks for having us. Yeah, glad to be here. So I know that the first military-style shooter that I really played I want to say it was Counter Strike, but I'm curious, what was it for y'all? Probably Counter Strike. I remember there was a there was a, a first person shooter called Delta Force uh, that for PCs that I played a lot of. Also, actually, now I think about it, there was a like a sort of a simulator uh, style shooter. Uh, I think it was just called SEAL Team Six. Uh, that that was explicitly about about the Navy SEALs. I remember being a young kid and thinking, "Now this is this is serious gaming. This isn't this isn't like you know uh, huge explosions and car chases and like this is like this is what real war is like." And so I think I mean immediately, the way the games industry presents war, it was already something that was happening to me as a young kid. 
I think for me it was Rainbow Six. Those first few Rainbow Six games. I think they started in like 1998, and Counter Strike is like a year later. In position. There was a lot of stuff that you could see going into Counter Strike and other military style shooters later. That really, I think, kind of started in Rainbow Six. Uh, I think it's also in the, the Tom Clancy realm. Uh, I'd have to go with Ghost Recon, the first one. Uh, and it set up the the trend of having like the nondescript kind of Russians as the enemy, right? I, re I can't remember the game, but I remember the ad really well. It said something like, this game is so realistic, you won't know whether it's a video game or CNN. It was probably Desert Strike. Uh, as my that guess, sounds because right. Yeah, there was this boom of post Gulf War games. There was so much excitement in the gaming industry that all of these Cold War era weapons, helicopters, tanks, guns, were seeing action. That this is also the first war that we see, right? Like a lot of people watched yeah. uh, the Gulf War via CNN. Like that's why that ad copy makes sense because. It was shot. It was like part of the propaganda for the U.S. was to show how overwhelming, you know, the military force was and just kind of like flex power. So to have that then get translated to the Genesis or the SNES feels like in kind in some way, you know? You know, it's also, you know, pushing that myth of the uh, precision strike, right? Um, exactly. The idea that there's a clean war and that we can specifically target only the bad guys, you know? I mean, when you when you, we start talking precision stuff and the, the clean war, right? Matthew, I know you've done a lot of reporting on drones and also on PTSD. The clean war stuff is really interesting. We're sitting here talking about these games like Apache, like Desert Strike, that were really focused on this top-down view of conflict. You're, you're in a helicopter, right? You're blowing stuff up. You're kind of removed from the visceral uh, death that you're causing. And there's a sense, um, I think, in the American public that drones are the clean, precision version of that. But in actuality, drone pilots experience PTSD at rates similar to, not completely comparable with, pilots that are, you know, flying F-16s and F-35s. Even this weird gamification of war that we're experiencing doesn't let people, doesn't let the active duty soldier off the hook. That's not the fantasy that we're, that, that video game companies want to sell people. I think the closest we got was, I believe it was Call of Duty 4, where we have that, uh, that one level where the, uh, the gunner on a AC-130 gunship. Yeah, that, that, I think the name of that level was just Death From Above. And there's VO, there's voiceover from the pilots and the, and the gunner, and they're just ice cold. Yeah, take them out. Yeah, good kill. I see lots of little pieces down there. Clear to engage all of those. You got them. At the time, I thought, this is a brilliant critique of what modern warfare is. Then like one or two games removed from that, that same style of combat, they just dropped it right into the multiplayer. And that is when I like started getting a little more skeptical about that series and whether or not it was able to actually wield critique or if it was just trying to like, you know, sell copies to people who thought it was cool when the, when the gunship blew things up. <laughs> this is gonna be one hell of a highlight reel. Yeah, I heard that. Steven, when did you join the Marine Corps? And if you could tell me about what was your time like in the Marines? Yeah, so I, I joined up when I was 17. Uh, I was super moto to join. Uh, got my parents to, to sign that waiver so I could do it. Uh, I even graduated high school early so I could go to boot camp as early as possible. Deployed to Iraq. Uh, ended up being getting blown up in an IED in 2008 uh, in Fallujah. And then spent two years at Walter Reed going through physical therapy, uh, learning how to walk again and use prosthetics and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was, I, was, I, was in the, I was in denial for a long time. I remember thinking like, oh, well, this isn't, I can come back from this. I can, uh, you know, I kind of wanted to, to re-enlist to be like a helicopter pilot. And I was like, oh, I could do that, you know, with no legs. <laughs> and then, then it really hit me, like the seriousness uh, of my situation, uh, you know, how, how much my life had changed and was going to change. When you were when you were recovering, what were you doing? Uh, yeah, video games were really important to pretty much 
everyone there going through therapy, right? Because, you know, one of the things being in the military, especially in the infantry, like when you're not out in the field training, you're in your, you're in your barracks room, like playing video games with your buddies. Um, so it's already in, it's already built into our culture. Um, and so, you know, afterwards, obviously, um, we still want to go play our video games. Uh, and they're really, they became really important because, you know, you'd go through physical therapy for a few hours every day uh, and you're worn out and tired. So you get back to your room, you just need to relax. And, uh, you know, how, you know, we relaxed by, you know, getting online, playing some Halo 3. I mean, it was, it's also a, a way we stayed in touch with all our buddies who uh, were still in our old units, you know, because, mm. you know, you get, you get wounded, uh, you get evac'd out immediately, you get shipped back to the United States. You know, there's no time to like say goodbye or to have that kind of closure with your buddies. Um, so if you can get online and like play video games with them, uh, you know, it almost feels like you're back in the barracks with them uh, doing one mm. on one-on-ones on Rust or something. Uh, <laughs> and that, you know, psychologically, that's, that, you know, that's, that helps a lot of guys out and it helped me out when I was going through it. Video games were like the one thing where I didn't need a handicap to play, right? I didn't need special equipment. Um, I could still be just as good, you know, as I was uh, getting headshots on uh, in Halo 3 as I was before, you know. So that was a bit morale booster for uh, for me, and I know for a lot of guys uh, as well. It's interesting that you've identified this way in which video games were therapeutic for you in this unofficial capacity where you're able to connect to other people, talk to your old squad mates, you know, be, you know, uh, connect to people uh, and, and also just blow off steam and how important that was. But on the other hand, now in 2020, you know, in the reporting Dexter did for this episode, I know, you know, uh, uh, he looked at uh, ways in which the military are using things like video games directly as a therapeutic. You know, uh, I think in this case, it was exposure therapy basically via VR. And I'm curious how you feel about that stuff, Stephen. I mean, I think it's great. Like if it, uh, you know, if it's actually helping people um, with their trauma, then, you know, I think they should I think it's great. I think they should definitely do it. Talking about exposure therapy, I'm, I'm not sure I would want to, <laughs> you know, go through that again, even in like a controlled, safe environment. Like it's weird, like with video games, I'm able to separate it and I realize, okay, this is a video game, but with like movies, I can't do it. When a video game, you have direct control over the action to a certain extent, right? And in a movie, you're along for the ride. Yeah. Yeah, and it could be, it could be a control issue. I found that to be, relaxing, I don't know. It wraps around to me to something else that Dexter, you learned about in the episode where you were talking to the doctor who runs the VR clinic. And one of the things that he said that kind of like struck me and froze me in place was that he was helping to develop technologies that would not only treat PTSD, but would attempt right. to prevent it from developing in the first place. Here's what's going on in your body. And here, is a methodology that might help you to cope with it. Obviously, we want to help people get through their, their trauma and, uh, you know, to overcome it, right? Um, but at the same time, we don't want to be, I think Dexter, you mentioned this in the video, is you don't want to create people who are just like emotionless uh, machines, essentially willing, you know, with no moral compass, um, mm. who are capable of, you know, doing whatever you tell them, right? The thing that I the thing that I think is worth saying here is that if such a if such a priming you know system uh, was perfected, fundamentally changes the calculus of when and where we are comfortable going to war and under what conditions. You you're opening the door to a lot of things you cannot predict, and I think you just have to be very confident that you're ready to open that door before you but before you do. Well, I think we've opened the door clearly. Yeah, the door is open. Yeah. The doors open. I mean, how, 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 does, how does that strike you, Stephen? I mean, uh, is, is there a danger where we're a little bit more okay with saying, you know what, maybe we will invade this place? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, you know, all the way to like the logical conclusion, right? That's kind of where it's going. Um, if it's not, you know, guided in the correct, in the correct way. Um, but it doesn't seem that bad. Uh, people are just fine when they come back. It, it seems you get more to that kind of the clean war fallacy, right? We can speculate all day, but we, we actually don't know what effects that's gonna have. There is a lot in there that we've only just begun to unpack and we can go on for this for hours, but 
we got to get going, and I want to thank you all for joining me, uh, especially you, Stephen, for sharing your experience with us. And all of you, definitely come back next time for more Reset the Unauthorized Guide to Video Games.